Okay, you ready? Yes. Ready to rock and roll? All right. Ready for the first question? I am. <laughs> so, first off, we're here. Is this still Canton, Georgia? It is. Right, so it we're is. here in Canton, Georgia, USA, where you've been here for... Uh, 40 years. Uh, 40 this years. past June was 40 years that I built my house and moved in. Good. And who are we here with? What's that? Who are we here with? Oh, James <laughs> Ronald Cooper. Everybody calls me Ron, and my pottery name is J.R. Cooper. J.R. Cooper. <laughs> and who is J.R. Cooper? Well, J.R. Cooper is uh, someone who was raised up in a little railroad community called Cast Station, Georgia. And it was uh, kind of a poor community, but fortunately for me, there was a main highway that was called the Old Dixie Highway, real close to where I lived. And uh, there was a pottery shop on that highway that worked young boys. So growing up in this little rail railroad community paid off in a big way for me. Nice. Is that where you found your start for pottery? Yes. That was, and that was with Mr. Cooper, am I right? There's W.J. Gordy. W.J. Gordy, mm -hmm. that's it. Right. So when was that? You were, you were young when you started. I was very young. Uh, I finished eighth grade, so uh, I would have been 14 years old. And just as soon as eighth grade was out, I had uh, the summer before I went into eighth grade, I got a job washing dishes in a restaurant on the old Dixie Highway. And, uh, and a year later, Mr. Gordy had a young man working for him that had made the varsity football team and didn't have time to work part-time anymore. And so Mr. Gordy waited for me uh, late one evening when I got off my shift at, uh, after washing dishes at the restaurant and asked if I would like to come to work for him. And so the next day I started with him and that was, uh, that would have been uh, in May of 1960, uh, 1959. And then I worked for Mr. Gordy uh, after school, Saturdays, and all summers up until a couple of months after I graduated from high school. And then I left the pottery shop then. Wow. Why you? Why me? Yeah. Why did Mr. Gordy wait outside for you? Did you know him previous or? I did. In fact, uh, I was playing in the creek one day when I was about 10 and uh, saw him go to the little uh, store there. It, it was a general store. They sold groceries and, and um, some clothes, horse feed. They sold a various uh, line of products. I saw him go to the store and I knew him. I had been to his shop as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so when he went in the store, I went over and sat down on the bench outside the store. And when he came back out, he, he noticed me and he said, well, hey, Ronald, said, you, you've turned into a pretty big boy. <laughs> uh, he said, how old are you now? And I said, well, I'm 10. And he said, well, give it a couple more years and I'll give you a lifetime job. And it was just a gesture. But guess what? It turned out to be a lifetime job. Yeah. Turned out to be a yeah. lifetime that's job. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. That's nuts. And that was 14. 14. 14 mm -hmm. years old. I mean, when you think about what I was doing when I was 14 years old. Yeah, exactly. You, couldn't, you can't even get jobs at 14 <laughs> no. years old anymore. It's a different no. time, isn't it? Yeah. That's crazy. And then you stopped for a while. I did. When I graduated from high school, uh, I, I had planned to get married uh, right after. In fact, we set the wedding up for July the 4th of that same year. And uh, we were both 18. Mm -hmm. And I needed a job that paid a little bit more. I approached Mr. Gordy and asked him, would he consider paying me enough to stay? And uh, we didn't reach an agreement, uh, but there was no disagreement. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, we just kind of parted ways, but still friends. Uh, so much so that I, I kept going back up there over the years until I took this up. Uh, several times a year I would go up there and spend time with him but um, he hired me to do uh, the, mixing the clay um, sweeping the floors mowing the lawn uh, wedging the clay having all the clay ready for him 
His daughter also turned pottery for him in the summer. Her name was Grace Bearden, Grace Gordy Bearden. She was a teacher. And in the summer, she would work in the pottery shop. So in the summertime, I would keep clay on the wheel for him and for her. So I would mix it, make the balls uh, of clay to, to make the pottery out of. And when we loaded the kiln, I would uh, do my part of that. He never would let me lo actually <laughs> load the kiln, but he would let me unload the kiln. Right, okay. okay. <laughs> But loading a kill is a little complicated. It's kind of like, uh, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And I do understand why he didn't allow me to to have a big part in that. And I probably would be the same way if I had a helper. When you're loading the kill, you're also trying to, you're trying to get things out for your chef, but you also have a commitment to someone to fill an order. So you're trying to get those things in there first. Right. And then you can call somebody and say, well, your order's ready. So I, I could understand that. Yeah. yeah. I funny. understand everything he did. He, he never let me near his glazes. I understand that. Yeah. But I did get his clay formula because guess what? I was the one mixing it. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he maybe so, didn't give you it, but so, he gave yeah, you it. Yeah, yeah. So I walked away with the clay formula. And of course he knew that. Yeah. He knew that. Yeah. I'm just going to turn your mic 90 degrees. I mean, go and reach in and grab the magnet, if okay. you grab the magnet, so it doesn't just fall down. I'm actually just going to clip it here, because it'll be better. You can, I'll take that magnet back off here, because you've got a nice strap there okay. that'll work a little bit better. So it's facing you, I don't want to miss anything. Um, so, for how many years did you go back to visit Mr. Gordy to help out? Well, to begin with, I took a job in a hardware store right out of high school, and I worked there that summer. And then I worked in a Union Carbide Plastics plant for a year. Uh, all the time visiting Mr. Gordy and even making pieces that I have in my collection from time to time. Uh, then after a year at Union Carbide, I became a milkman door to door. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I delivered milk for two years. And... Uh, in, um, let's see, September, August, June, in June of 1966, I left that and went to work for Kmart Corporation. And I worked in a store in Marietta. And uh, I had only been there two and a half months. And I got my notice to uh, come for uh, physical to be drafted. And for then, Vietnam, that would have been well, at that either. I, yes, I got drafted uh, in uh, on September the seventh, nineteen sixty six, and went for basic training at Fort Benning. Stayed there for two and a half months, and after basic training, I went to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Took my wife with me. We lived out there, and then after we'd been out there for nine months, I got uh, orders to go to Vietnam. Had to bring her back to Cartersville, Georgia, and uh, I loaded up and took off to Vietnam for a year. Wow. And while wow. I was over there, my oldest daughter was born. She was five months old when I saw her. Oh. Wow. First time. Oh. Wow. So from Potter to jobs just to keep afloat. Yeah. So, and, and throughout all this time, did you know you were going to come back to Pottery? That was, my goal was to come back. Right, uh, okay. And part of the reason that I was, uh, th there was some fear involved in it. Because part of the reason is I thought that I had to, I thought that I had a standard set for me and I had to live by that standard. Mm -hmm. And it was the highest standard you could have. It was W.J. Gordon. Yeah. One yeah. of the foremost potters in the world. Yep. And uh, even he told me, Ron said, sometimes you get discouraged, but don't. He said, Things happen, and and he said you will notice yourself changing levels, changing level. And was he ever right? And and you do, you go through stages, and uh, so over a period of time, I watched myself go to a new stage to a point where I would look at the work I did at this stage, and think, why did I do that? Well, you saw the first face joke I made, you know. Hey, man, I couldn't make it. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, the the good thing about Mr. Gordy, well, there was a lot of good things, but 
he never gave any bad advice. He was he was a good role model. And hey, he was the man I spent all of my impressionable years with every yeah. day after school, Saturday, all summer. I was with Mr. Gordy all the time. So he had a he had a lot of influence on on uh, my work habits, the kind of person that I am a lot, a lot. Oh, lucky to have that, yeah. you know. What is some of that advice that you still stick by? Is there any you can share maybe with other makers that are listening to this? Well, his work ethic uh, was impeccable. Uh, and he. this is one of the things that he would tell me. If you plan to do this, you can't be a sportsman. In other words, you can't spend Saturdays hunting or playing golf Sunday afternoon because you're going to be working all week to make pottery and then every Saturday you'll be meeting customers selling pottery. Yeah. So uh, his worth e e ethics uh, was the, a, a goal of mine too. Right. So Something you aspire to. I'm not a golfer. Yeah. I'm not a hunter. I don't fish. All the spare time I have, I spend with my family, with my wife, and we do something together because my time is so limited. And another thing too, when you work at home, it's easy to go back and work a couple of hours after dinner, or we if know you that. need some, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So, or a of couple of hours into the early hours yeah. of the morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 been yeah. there. Yeah, um, but he mentions me in his book, in and I think it's a very favorable light. Because his what you call his, it a favorable lie. <laughs> well, his his account of what happened is that after I had worked for him for a couple of years, that the IRS had uh, come and looked at all of his records. Well, as a result of that, uh, they sent me a letter telling me that he owed me twelve hundred dollars back wages. So I got the letter at my house. And I stuck the letter in my back pocket, didn't show it to my parents, I stuck it in my back pocket. And when I went to work that morning, he was standing by, it's kind of like a fireplace, but it's, it's called a pottery dryer, and it's a box where you build a fire, and then a chimney runs across the floor, and then out the roof, and you put pottery above it and it dries. Well, he had a fire in that, and, and was standing there, backed up to it when I walked in that morning. And I backed up, with him and we're standing there talking. He's asking me how my night was and and uh, was I ready to go to work and just, you know, small talk. Was it that a normal conversation to have oh, with yeah. him in the morning right now? Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. He, he always asked me how my day was, how did it go, did you have a test today? He, he was always concerned about my education yeah. too. So I said, well, Mr. Gordy, I got something in the mail and I reached in my pocket and I pulled it out and handed it to him. And he opened it up and he said, well, Ronald, I got one of these too. He said, uh, it's up to you. He said, uh, they've told you that I owe you $1,200. And he said, uh, but it's up to you. What are you going to do about it? And I took the paper out of his hand and threw it in the fire. And I said, I gave you my word that I'd work for you for this much. And that's my word. And he said in the book, he said, I never heard any more about it. No. Now, to give you an So idea, was that a letter from the IRS saying that he was under, he was, he'd maybe not met the minimum wage or something like that? Or There's some question about that. Uh, the way he tells it in the book is that he didn't pay me overtime and, right. and I'll stick with that. Yeah. I'll stick with that. Nice. But, um, but um, nothing was ever said about it after that. But to give you an idea of what twelve hundred dollars was in nineteen sixty, a brand new car. Wow. And guess what I didn't have? Guess what my family didn't have? They yeah. didn't have a car. That's the reason my dad never saw the letter. Mm. So okay. it'd be it would be so easy for people to look at this and say, Oh, why didn't you? You're Do you know because of the employee employer culture at the minute? Like, oh no, you were due that, why didn't you take it? Right. Why didn't you take it? Well, I, I'd like to think that 
that what guided me more than anything was the agreement that I gave him, although I was 14 years old. Yeah. And looking back on it, it would have been easy to let the money get in your way, but I didn't. So much so that soon after, I totally forgot about it and may not have even ever recalled the incident to anybody until his book came out and it was in the book. And I was very surprised to see it in the book. Very surprised. It obviously meant a lot to him. Yeah. yeah well, uh, I, I guess so because uh, being a teenager, and I had a brother that had worked there. I had a cousin who was killed in Korea that worked there. And my dad had worked there for Mr. Gordy. And so I was the, I was the fourth in my family to work there. I was very proud of the job. I was proud to have the job. And, and, and my goal was one day to make a living doing this. I didn't know how I would ever do it because everything seemed so distant to me. Uh, like, how, you know, how would I even start a business? How would I, I, I wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. And, and that hung in there a long time and, and it was an obstacle for me. It took a long time to get over that. Mm -hmm. But the day I left my job, now I started opening stores for Kmart, and I opened 32 stores. They're all closed now, but uh, that was pretty much my job for the last several years I worked there. But when I left, uh, well, before I left, I started seriously doing this on the side to the point where I was doing 20, 25 craft shows a year and working my job there, too. And so I had reached a point where I thought I would be able to at least make what I was making there. So one day I had just built these shelves in my basement. And you can see these and those and the these ones over there. These exact shelves. These shelves. And I had made these bats to set the pottery yeah. on yeah. so you can lift and not be too much. And so I decided I, I was taking a week's vacation because I got five weeks of vacation a year with Kmart. So I was taking one of those weeks trying to get them all in before I quit, mm -hmm. put in my notice. So I decided that on Monday I was going to make pottery steady all week, work at least 10 hours a day. And at the end of the week, I would put the calculator to it and see how much money I'd made or, or how much I would be able to make. And so I did, and it was a little better than I was making. And, wow. I, and I thought, well, you know, I'm sitting here on the stool thinking, wow, that, this is pretty good. I can do this. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it dawned on me. Not only have you got to make all that pottery, but you got to sell, sell it. it. <laughs> yeah. Who are you going to sell yeah. it to? Yeah. And then not just me, not just my mind, but a lot of people w were saying, well, Ron, if you do this, how do you know you'll make a living? Who are you going to sell that pottery to? Mm. So other people were thinking about it, I guess, yeah. before I was. Yeah. But guess what? I, I started doing craft shows 20 to 25 a year, dropped down to 15, finally honed it down to about six. And then in 1997, I totally stopped doing the craft shows. And so I just sell it from here now. Mm -hmm. And it worked out perfectly. Um, but the day I put him a notice, I never, ever, ever looked back or had a second thought. I never said, have nice. I done the right thing? It, I just, it was straightforward. That's a good never feeling, I bet. Back. Yeah. And now I'm 78, so I guess I'll have to say I made it. Yeah, I think you made yeah. it. <laughs> Everything passed now is just gravy. Yeah. What would you say to all those people, or maybe there is people listening to this, that they've got exactly those same influences in their life that are saying, oh, but how will you make it work? How will you make Because it's, it's very common for craftsmen to, to receive that, not negativity, but that a doubt. doubt from other people, that external doubt, which does weed in to people's minds. You know, people start yeah. thinking, oh, maybe I can't. What would you say to that? Well, um... First of all, well, let me inject one more thing. When I had made up my mind that I was going to come and do this, I had made up my mind thinking 
that I wouldn't have any uh, health insurance. Right. Mm -hmm. Because my wife had stopped working when our children came. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when, when I started doing the pottery on the side, she started substitute teaching at a school in South Cherokee County. So I had decided that I was going to go one more month and put in my notice. And I told her, I said, okay, in a month, I'll be putting in my notice. That very day, she called me and said, Ron, they have hired me as a school, as, a sec as one of the secretaries at the school. She finished that year out. The next year, she became the school secretary. And then she spent 30 years working for the school system. Well, she had our insurance. Which covered you. It covered me. Yeah, covered me, and that was a that was a big obstacle. It was a big obstacle then, and it's still one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still a big obstacle, but there are ways around it now. I'm sure that there's help that people can get with a small business. I never did get any uh, because I started planning for this and putting money aside, so I never had to have any help. But I'm sure there is. But the biggest thing is overcoming your fears and not let them dominate you. Uh, there's so much satisfaction in what I have done versus what I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I can look back now and, and take pride in knowing that 200 years from now, somebody will be holding a piece of my work wondering who I was. Yeah. So in that sense, I've made a mark, uh, and a mark that I'm very proud of. You've got to start somewhere. I'm sure that if you have a painting in your house, that if you went back and looked at the first painting that person ever did, you might not have had it in your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may want it in your house now because they did become famous or whatever. Yeah. But but it's the same way. It's the same way with this. You, you find yourself and and if you get into this business and your needle never moves and you become satisfied, I don't know how that would be. I've, I've never been that way. I've always looked for a better way, uh, not so much an easier way, because a lot of times easy means that you have to forfeit uh, quality, and you don't want to do that. Yeah. You'll put yourself out of business if you do. But, but there's so many things that play with your mind that you have to overcome. And, and picture this. Uh, when I started to leave, my wife didn't have a job. But when I did leave, my daughter was finishing up eighth grade. My son was finishing up seventh grade. They were getting ready to go in high school. Yep. College was coming. And, and I'm stepping out on my own. No sick days, no paid holidays. And when I say fears, I'm telling you some of the fears. But you've got to over, overcome those if you want the satisfaction. And uh, money, you got to have money to live, but money's not everything. Being rich is not everything. Being happy is. Yeah. Can't buy happiness. Can't buy happiness. Like you, you cannot. You cannot buy happiness. And let me inject something else right here. I told you that my daughter was born when I was in Vietnam and she was five months old. Hmm. My son got word of that. So I'd been back from Vietnam, August, so September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, 10 months later, okay? We have baby number two coming. Two o'clock in the morning, my wife got out of bed, went in the bathroom and stayed a little while and I jumped up and ran in there and I said, are you okay? She said, the baby's coming. Yeah. Long story short, I took her back to the bed ran to try to get a neighbor to come help. And when I got the neighbor back to my house, the baby was crying. So my son, <laughs> my wife had my son oh. by herself. Oh my goodness. <laughs> by herself. Despite the fact you were only across the road trying to get a neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Um. And I, was, I, had that, I had that lady by the night coat and nightgown and I'm pulling her out the door and she says, I don't know, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, neither do I, but you've got to come help me. And she said, well, okay, but let me get my snuff. And she's grabbing for a snuff can. Oh. While your baby's been born. <laughs> yeah, while the baby's been born. Oh. So, so what's that journey looked like for you from, right, today's the day, I'm going to go self-employed. I've got all these fears, but I'm going to overcome them, to now. 
to now. Like that, that's an expanse of time. Yes. Yeah. And the world's changed a million times over oh, yeah. since then. Yeah, it has. Um, in fact, um, the the face jug that I have, that uh, the first one that I made that, that I was able to buy back on eBay. Which is crazy. When I got it, <laughs> it had in magic marker $3 on the bottom of it. Really? Mm-hmm. Now, Mr. Gordy priced all of his stuff with pencil, but that would probably, when I made it, it probably would have sold for about $3. Mm-hmm. But Mr. Gordy used to say it like this. He said, well, everything's relative, you know. When, when I was making uh, 50 cents an hour, a hamburger was a nickel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To put everything into a proper perspective, when I was a kid or when I was working with Mr. Gordy, I could get a Coke for a nickel. I only ever got a Coke every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Now that they're a dollar, I can drink them all the time if I want to. Yeah. So things change, but you've got to let yourself rise above, rise above the changes and change with it and not, and not try to stay on that level. There's not just levels of, of uh, craftsmanship. There's also levels of business that you've got to go through, too. Mm-hmm. And um, I know... I know for a long time I wouldn't take credit cards because of the hassle of it. Mm-hmm. Now I take Venmo. Yeah. And my kids say, you take Venmo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you need to adopt you know that. To it, don't you? Yeah, exactly. But, uh, but, it, but the trip, it's almost like when I decided this is what I'm going to do, and I don't know what it is about me or if it's this way with a lot of people, when I decided this is it, it was here and not here. Mm. I, I just I focused on that instead of this, and and it seems to have gone without a hitch. Of course, I can look back, and if I think, I can tell you some hitches. You know. Yeah. If we start digging deep enough, you'll, yeah. Yeah. you'll start crying on the floor. But <laughs> no, we're okay. Yeah. You just don't dwell on those. Yeah. Yes. You know, you overcome those, and you go to the tomorrow. Yeah. You go to tomorrow. Celebrate the good times. Celebrate the good times. Yeah. How do you feel about craftsmanship at the moment? Because it feels like at the moment, and you're way more qualified to answer this than Kate and I because you've been doing it longer, but it feels like at the moment it's on a resurgence. Certainly my parents' generation, it was... On, in decline. Big time. Like My mum and dad try their absolute best to understand what we are doing. Yeah. yeah. Travelling the world, like four and a half thousand miles away from home, talking to a potter. In backcountry Georgia, yeah, you know, and and they just they can't fathom it, and they try really hard, and you know, credit to them, and I understand why they don't get it because mm-hmm. they don't understand that this is a thing people do, right? How has that looked over that time? Because you've just just been a craftsman throughout that time. Do you notice a resurgence now? Was there big declines? What's that expanse looked like? I guess the way I f- I noticed the decline was uh, having been a part of the craft shows for so many years. I started, and I guess I guess that's a pretty good indicator when you're in a craft show, and all of a sudden, you start seeing more people selling, reselling stuff than selling their craft. Okay. And and it looked like that if you were in a, if you walked through a show that had two hundred vendors, uh, thirty or forty might be there with their craft, and the other others would be questionable uh, a lot of the things that people were making it was hard to tell if they made them mm-hmm. or if they were, had purchased them and they're reselling them mm-hmm. but I have noticed a lot I can kind of tell the the renewed interest by what people say to me and the kind of reaction I get from people when I talk to them and there is a resurgence that's good uh, the the biggest the biggest thing right now is is if you're if you're an american citizen in this country if you're an american citizen and 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 you're going to start out in a business i don't know where you go for help yeah now if if you've come into the country they've got they've got programs for you mm-hmm. but i'm not so sure that they have a lot of help for somebody like me that gave up their job mm-hmm. uh, 
because I was showing a pretty good income. I'm living in a, in a moderate home on a small tract of land, so I'm making it. And whether there was money there for me or not, I don't know it because I did. I never tried to get it. Yeah, you know that's something that's interesting to see because there definitely is back home money for people that are starting out that want to start something, but not the position that you found yourself in, where you were making money and mm -hmm. you decided, no, I want to go and try this. Yeah, that's a funding gap that certainly, and someone might listen to this and say, no, you're wrong and great, I'd like to hear about it. Yeah. But that funding gap is non-existence. You know, Kate and I turned 30 last year and we've always self-funded this because I've been working full time, it's just the way we like to, to do things. But when we started looking for funding, because we are 30 now, there's nothing. Yeah. yeah. Like if you're under 30, there was stuff. Because we're 30 now, there's nothing. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be there. Or for the type of business that we're, mm -hmm. no one quite understands it. But yeah. 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 Anyway. Throughout all that period that you've been doing this, was there any period that you thought, maybe it's today, maybe it's back then, this would have been the perfect time to start? I think all along. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think my timing was more than adequate. I think my timing was practically perfect. Nice. Um, it came at a time when, um, well, it, it came at a time when the uh, arts and crafts uh, availability was real high. So there were a lot of really good quality shows that drew a lot of very interested people. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to sell a good product. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me, those years that I did that, which would have been from 1980, uh, 81 basically, then 83 is when I did it full time. But from about 83 to 97, so that's 14 years in there that I built a customer base and I very carefully recorded all those people so that I could contact. And uh, so now, even now, I still have a communication with them. Most of them are my Facebook friends now. Nice. Nice. So if I want them to know something, I'll post something. Yeah. And, if, and Facebook has been real good for my business because... Um, I may go like right now is a is a is a kind of a soft time for people in in the crafts mm -hmm. because it's back to school. Mm -hmm. But give it a month and then people will start thinking about inside. You can go to a craft show in May and then go back to that same spot for a craft show in October. And you will sell four times as much in October as you did in May. So what you got to do is you've got to discipline yourself and say, well, I'm not going to draw real good paydays in the spring, but I, I need the product in the fall. So on that February morning that it got down to two degrees, you come out and turn on the heater and come out here and work that day because you know in October you're going to need that pottery. Yeah. 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 So okay. that's you, you have to have a lot of discipline and you have to be kind of tenacious with yourself. Yeah. You have to kind of push yourself. Yeah. It, yeah, you need self motivation too. Yeah, you need self motivation. That's part of it. And that's that's why a lot of people really fail in their own businesses. They don't have a lot of self motivation. But I think desire I think if desire is strong enough, it, you overcome a lot of things. Mm. And I think my desire was there. I agree uh, with that. There never was a point that I gave up from the time I left the pottery until I, 16 years later, re-entered. There never was a time that I said, well, I just won't be able to do it. But there came a time when I had to say, it's time to say, show that I can or probably never will. So this is do or die. So, do or die. Yeah. Kind of do or die. <laughs> I'll find somebody to sell all that pottery to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I can make it, I can sell it. Quite right. Fortunately for me, uh, I have never had to miss. Uh, I had 
shoulder uh, rebuilt in 1997, and that's the most time I missed. I missed, uh, well, I actually missed 30 days working, and then when I started back, I could only make very small pieces, so I started out making miniatures, and I made little mice and little rabbits by hand because I couldn't move this shoulder. <laughs> and uh, and I made uh, little miniature pictures and vases, and I made about wow. 400 of those. And then after a week or two, I graduated up, and I made size about that big, and I made all those. Hmm. And I just had an ample supply of little stuff before I could start back on the big stuff. You should have kept them all and framed them all. Like, <laughs> yeah. with the progression of your shoulder getting yeah. better, slightly yeah. better and better and better. <laughs> That'd be nice. There's only one person that has a piece of my pottery for every year that I have been J.R. Cooper pottery. It would have been my brother because he helped me put the roof <clears throat> on this building. And when I tried to pay him, he said, no. He said, I've got a piece of your pottery for every year he said, and I want you to give me a piece every year, did, uh, one piece, a jug. So I did. Five years ago, uh, about five or six years ago, his wife died, and he gave my son those pieces. So now my son has that intact all the way from 1979 all the way through to 2023. Wow, really? That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. He's got it. What a thing to have. Yeah. What a collection to have. Yeah. So I make him one every year. Yeah. And, and so you keep that going. Keep so it going. Keep going. Yeah, keep it going. That's brilliant. So these buildings, you say, put the roof on it. You built these buildings, didn't you? Mm -hmm. From the ground up. And yeah. you built, talk me through that. I think you built this one first and then you killed one after. I built this one in 1987 and I built that one in 1990. As pottery sheds. You built them to work in here as your pottery studios, didn't you? That's right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, to begin with, I had my kills in this room <clears throat> and did that for three years. And the reason I hesitated to put my kill room out there is because the pottery that I make is in here. Yeah. Well, it's got to go over there. Well, my glaze room was in here. So then I had to take it out of the kill, bring it back, glaze it, and then take it back. And after a few years of trying to figure it out, it dawned on me, we'll move your glaze over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Simple so now, thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I only have to make one trip over and one trip back. Nice. <laughs> nice. It looks like you've got your process pretty much, yeah. you know, yeah. nailed. Yeah, you've been great. doing it a while to get your process yeah. nailed. Do you think that's important for someone, spending the time and the money it to is. just get that right? It is, yeah. You, uh, it'd be nice to have a real big workshop. Yeah. But it's also nice to make a piece of pottery and take two steps to put it down. But but have plenty of room close by mm -hmm. so that you don't have to take a lot of extra steps uh, to, to get to it. And, uh, and that works good. So <clears throat> you do all the work on it here, and then you move it into the next room and let it dry, and then move it over there and burn it the first time, glaze it and burn it the second time. It's like a little production line yeah, through it, it's, isn't it? It's through kind of there. production and I guess for the first uh I don't know, twenty five years that I was doing this on my own, I guess I would be called a production potter. Mm. And and probably in the last uh ten, fifteen years I've I've spent more time on detail work. Mm. And uh, what changed? Well, uh, the repetition, you know, when you're doing, when you're doing production, you're going to make cream and sugars. You say, well, I'll make 30 sets of cream and sugars. Yeah. And you just over and over, and it's so repetitious. Whereas now, I make three jugs on Monday, spend Tuesday putting faces on them, make a, three more jugs on Wednesday, spend Thursday, and then maybe on Friday make a few bowls and pitchers and just the, you still need to have a mix. Yeah. My retail, my retail experience really helped me also in this business because I always thought you had, when you presented your pottery for sale, I always thought you needed something for the little old lady that didn't have much money. And then you needed something for the person that didn't care how much it cost. And so I would have something for $3.00. And then I have something for fifty dollars. So, and I think that always helped. That mm. when I would go to a show, I would I would always do good sales at the show because I tried to include everybody. 
Yeah. yeah, that's nice. So what point did the face jugs start coming about? Well, uh, I did a lot of thinking about what, you know, if you go to a barbecue place, they have to have something. I don't, do y'all do barbecue? Not like you guys do it, but when we've been here, we've, we've done barbecue. Here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, I'm using a barbecue place as an example. Well, if you if you go back over and over and over, there has to be something that draws you back. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, their barbecue may not be the best in the world, but their French fries are to die for, mm -hmm. or their coleslaw melts in your mouth. You know, cornbread. You make whatever. me hungry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. I got to thinking, uh, when I'm no longer here, what will people say that I was known for as a potter? What will they say? Oh, okay. And I kind of got the idea, since I was making three sets of dishes a month for 40 years, that that would be what I'd be known for. But then I got this idea, and it started out, with it started out by me making a little face jug with the cap on it like my daddy bought me to wear to school yeah and i called it a crop duster i called it the cast station crop duster mm -hmm. and a friend of mine that lived in castle said i want that he said you need to make some more cast station stuff and i said well what, what do you think and he said well you you grew up in cast station he said there's all kinds of possibilities. So I got to thinking about that. Well, about halfway through the process of making 100 each of seven different characters, it dawned on me that that might be what I'm known for. 700. 700. Took me 11 years. But wow. now remember, I was making dishes and doing craft shows and doing all the things that I had to have to survive along with that right okay but so i made the 700 and it took me 11 years to finish them well and they're finished now they're finished they're numbered but i still make them because i promised people i would only number 100 i didn't promise them i wouldn't make more right. i just don't number them yeah okay and, so the original ones are the numbered ones right and so i started concentrating a lot on that and well, you saw a picture of the first one. Well, if I showed you 1980, 1990, and 2000, you would see the progression. Uh, I can see the different levels now. And I'm at a point now where when I make the jug, uh, I've made some that I wish I had back. <laughs> yeah. Really? I'd say... Did that look good to me when I sold it? Yeah. <laughs> so you don't wish you had it back because it was a great one. You wish you had it back because you don't want it out there. Break it. Yeah. <laughs> Scrub your name off the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. But uh, there again, uh, it, if a person is, is thinking about doing this, uh, you don't have to be like anybody. You just have to be like yourself. And, That's and, good advice. And... Whatever you make, if it looks good to you, it's going to look good to somebody else. I mean, seriously, it will. And then, of course, I think that as a rule, you, a person would find themselves going through stages and getting better at a lot of different things. Mm. Uh, just more than making the pottery, but I guess I've enjoyed the business for the contact with people because it puts me in touch with so many people. And I'm in touch with the cream of the crop people. Yeah. They're people that are collecting my work. So they're fantastic people. Yeah, yeah they, they are. They appreciate you. <laughs> they they appreciate just, them. Yeah. They're not running the mill. Yeah. <laughs> so, I love it. What came to the... Do you think you could have started the face jugs earlier? Or were they what they are because of the skill set you had at the time. You know, if you started them, so there's a lot of people that get into, whether it's furniture making or whether it's metal fabrication or pottery, it's all, it's all similar, where they want to do this now. Yeah. yeah. They want to do the final project now. Mm. And, and I'm the same. I'm, I'm probably the worst in the world for it. I'm like, nope, I want to do the best of the best now. But there is so much to be said for starting simply 
mm-hmm. and building up to that, you know? Yeah, there is. And, um, you know, if you'd started the face mugs 10 years earlier or five years, would you have had the skill to do them or? Yeah, I think they would have sold. Uh, I, th- I think on the face jugs, the the whole concept of these were people. These face jugs were actually people. The hobo came by my house and asked for food. The storekeeper ran the general store. The ticket agent was at the gas station depot, which was part of the Great Locomotive Chase. It was one of the stops on the Great Locomotive yeah, yeah. Chase. The ball player was my brother and my daddy. Uh, my daddy managed the team. My brother played. The school teacher was the principal of, of the old gas station model school who later went to the consolidated school when they closed it and became a teacher there. She taught my daddy and two of my brothers. Oh, wow. So, so this, they're all based on people you knew. Yeah. Based on people that I knew. Now, the one that I had the most difficulty with was the last one. Let's see if I've left anything out. I think I've, I think I've told you all of them. The hobo, the teacher. All right, the last one turned out to be, and and... This is something that I really made the decision about when I finished six of the seven and I had one more to go. And I said, what will the last one be? And I really, I really wanted to include the section hand, the railroad section hand. Now, all the section hands that I saw as a kid working on the railroad were black. They were all black. Mm-hmm. And, I wanted, and I wanted to include that. Now, I did come back later and include a, a separate. But I finally made the decision to make the last one the potter and declare that it was me. And... And I didn't declare that it was Mr. Gordy because they were my face jokes. Right. It was my idea. I made one through six, and I capped it off with me. Now, it took a lot of soul searching to do that. Mm. <clears throat> but that was what I decided to do. Then I later came back, and I made a couple that I called Uncle Willis and Aunt Beulah. Mm-hmm. And, and Uncle Willis, he wasn't my uncle, but uh, Uncle Willis was uh, a retired railroad worker that took odd jobs uh, around. He, he liked mowed people's grass, uh, cut, cut uh, bushes from around streams. And that, a character, a wonderful, wonderful character. And so I captured them in that, and I feel proud about that, too. Yeah. yeah Love that's, that. It's uh, a good story. Th- th- those are out there. Uh, now, they didn't, get, they didn't get in with the set. But they got kind of personalized. Nice. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Do you, you said there, you know, it took a lot for you to put the potter out there, which was you and not Mr. Gordy. Was that the first time you feel that you became totally standalone from Mr. Gordy? Or will you always be intertwined? How do you feel about that? Well, um, I've, always, I've always tried to give him credit for what I was able to do, because without him, I couldn't have. He told me when I went to work there, he said, now, Ronnie, if you miss school, I'll, I'll just let you go. You won't be able to work here anymore. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. But I didn't miss a day in school the four years that I worked there. Wow. But I didn't miss a day in school two years before that. Last six years of school, mm. I didn't miss a day in school. But that was part of his ethic. Uh, you've got to you've got to be willing to work, and you've got to be willing to go to school, and and of course the working here is going to take the place of some of your uh, sports activities. So I, I was never able to play basketball or baseball or any of those mm-hmm. things because I was always working in there. Never regretted that at all. It probably just saved your knees and your elbows right. anyway. <laughs> yeah. But 
but I always, this is the way I felt about uh, Mr. Gordy and me. I always tried to give him credit, but not use him. Mm. Not use him as Not leverage your name off of his. Yeah. Right. I was trying to build, I was trying to build my name from the experience I got from him. And, and when the book came out, I felt like that I had, I had achieved that, that, that we, we, our friendship was still intact. In fact, I talked to him two days before he died. We had a real good conversation, and I felt real good about our our friendship all the way through. That's nice, all the way through. And was there any jealousy back and forth? There was certainly none here, because I admired him so much. Yeah. Uh, and if I if I ever had any fear that there was like any resentment that I had taken the reins and had done real good at it, then he set my mind at ease that last conversation we had. That's fantastic. He, he, I, I think it, it, was, it was a conversation that was meant to be. That's and cool. Yeah, it was. That's really nice that you managed to get a chance to talk I, that out at the end. I, I even gave him a piece of my pottery. He asked me, he said, what have you been doing different lately? I said, I made a new glaze, Mr. Gordy. I call it teal green. He said, well, I'd like to see it. And I said, well, it just so happens I've been to the newspaper. They did a picture and I took some pottery and I've got a piece in the truck. And I went out and brought it into him. And he said, well, how much do I owe you? And I said, you don't owe me anything. And I gave him that piece of, of the new glaze that I had done. That was the last, that was the last I saw him. Aww. That's brilliant. Now his, That's daughter, really his daughter has that piece now. Wow. There's so many interesting stories in this because it, because this has involved me with so many, many people. Uh, when, when one of my customers comes in and starts talking about somebody, yeah, I know them. You know, I, I, I know so yeah. many people. But I've, I've been in touch with so many people, and they inspire me. Uh, mm. it, you know, they, they have words of encouragement, too. That's good. And I've been it's always in, good to keep that channel two way, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah, it is. It's it's magnificent. I I wouldn't trade this for anything. The, oh, we think we're we often say this. We think we're the luckiest people in the world. We get to speak to all these amazing makers. Some that have only started for a year. Some that have left corporate jobs. Some that have been doing it since they were fourteen. Of all different crafts, of all different skill levels, of all different stages in their career. Yeah. You know, some are self-admitted, they've maybe got one or two years left. Some are one or two years in. And it's like, yeah. you just get mm -hmm. to speak to people. Like, how nice is it to just be able to speak to people? It's good to have that community behind yeah. you yeah. as well. Because the whole makers thing is just a big community, yeah. right, Kate? Yeah, it's uh, Let me tell you an interesting story. I may have mentioned it before we started. But uh, my brother that worked there uh, died when he was 40 he was just short of 44, he's 43. Worked with Mr. Gordy as well. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and when I went to work uh, for Mr. Gordy, he said, well, Ronald, I worked for him, but I never was able to make a piece of pottery, and I've got a piece of his, and I want you to make me a piece. So I made him a face jug and uh, gave it to him. And then later, he, he lived in uh, Florida at the time, and later he divorced remarried and moved to North Carolina and that's where he died. And so I had told my wife many times about making that jug for my brother. And I said, I don't know where it is. Nobody knows about it. I, I don't know what happened to it. I'd love to have it back. If I could find out who has it, I may buy it back, mm. you know, if it doesn't mean a lot to them. And then one day, a man from Emerson called me, and he said, there's a face jug on eBay that says you made it, and I think it's counterfeit. It doesn't look like your work. And I said, well, what makes you think it's counterfeit? He said, well, for one thing, your name is printed on the bottom. And I said, really? And I said, what else? He said, well, it kind of looks like Mr. Gordy's Mountain Gold. I said, oh. I said, okay, look at the bottom one more time. And tell me if there's anything else on the bottom of that piece of pottery besides my name. He said, well, yeah, bye, B-Y. I said, 
Oh my goodness. I said, that's a piece of pottery I made when I was a kid. I said, I made that at Mr. Gordy's shop. Didn't know what it was yet, okay? Didn't know how to buy anything from eBay. So I asked him if he would buy it for me, and he did. He said, what do you want to bid? And I said, nobody knows what it is. You didn't even know what it is, and I taught him to make pottery. Mm -hmm. You didn't think it was mine. And uh, I said, well, let's put in $610. You know how eBay works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I got it for 125 <laughs> And when it came in the mail, it was that jug that I made my brother in 1960. Wow. That's insane. And I got it back in my collection. Because someone that knows you had found it. Well, it came from Illinois. It, the man that owned it was in Illinois. That made it all its way all the way up to Illinois. Probably sold in a yard sale. Some relative. Does so that happen often to you, where you end up with pieces back? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I was able to buy another piece back this past summer in a in a uh, antique store in Adairsville, and it was a vase that I had made, and it I think it said I think on the bottom of it it said uh, J R Cooper on the bottom, but it's just a little vase about so tall, and. Now, some of the pieces that I made had Mr. Gordy's stamp. And then if, uh, for the last two years I worked there, I made pottery for him to sell in his shop, along with everything else I was doing, which meant not much, but mm. some. Yeah. Mostly ashtrays and little pictures. Yep. But uh, if there was one I wanted to keep, even though his stamp would be on it, he would write RC on it. And I've got several of those that has his stamp and that also. that's cool mm -hmm. what a lovely thing to have is there any that you wish you had that you don't have yes there's a piece that a lady in kingston owns and um i told her if she ever sells it i'd like to have it i made it when i was a teenager and it's the biggest piece i made it's a picture about that tall uh, it, i think it's a quart which is you know, a little the one small, that you spun off first. That's earlier. a half a gallon, so it'd, right. be, it'd be skinnier than that, okay. and maybe about inch and a half shorter. Right. But now I've got one that I made back then. It, it's it's a half a gallon, a quart piece in my collection, and then I also have some from the year I came back from Vietnam and went up there. I would go up there two or three times a year and make a piece, and he would burn it and tell me when I would go back, well, I've got the piece out here for you. Oh, cool. And never charge me anything for it. Just That's cool. burned it for me. But there's one piece out there, and you know where it is. Yes, you want and, that. Yeah. And, and I talked to her today and told her that, but she didn't respond. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what her reaction is going to be. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so what about when, when you started out, you know, with crafting getting bigger and people doing more and more, there's so many tools that are available. You know, there's whole companies set up making tools for people doing stuff like this. Yeah. You told the story earlier when you made your first wheel, it was like you were making a wheel out yeah. of like how's that all evolved? What are you know, for example, tell the story that about the the washing machine wheel you made the yeah. first time. That was quite interesting. Well, uh I learned on a kick wheel and uh and, and I've got a painting with a kick wheel right there that I learned on. So I kind of knew a little bit about, uh, about having the weight on the wheel or having to slow the wheel down. And Mr. Gordy had a wheel that he worked on that was clutch operated. And so I went up there and took pictures of his wheel and got a, an old washing machine motor and I bought some pulleys and ball bearings and some rods and i just made me a wheel and i made a fly wheel out of plywood about uh, probably about 12 14 inches across and then i took an old lawnmower wheel that i just got off of junk lawnmower and attached that to a shaft coming out of the washing machine motor and of course when you turn the wheel on the motor ran the whole time mm -hmm. <clears throat> but when you wanted to make a piece of pottery uh, I had the uh, lawnmower wheel that was turning all the time on the shaft that came out of the motor. 
I had a spring attached to it where when I pushed a foot pedal down here, it would pull that spring down against that wooden flywheel, and it was friction. And for the first probably at least five years, I made all my pottery on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, believe it or not, a Brent wheel back then was about $400. Yeah, and now they're worth about twenty six hundred dollars for a Brent CXC, wow. but I didn't have the four hundred dollars to to invest, so I made that first one, and I still got it. It's oh, down, yeah. yeah, it's down in the basement. Wow, yeah. that's good that you kept uh, it. It probably needs some work on it, and I don't know, I don't know who will want it. Maybe nobody, but but you if, got it. If anybody does, it's down there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Inventive and it's, doing what you can. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting story because it, it was it's fitting it's fitting to the story that was because I didn't have any money. I mean I didn't make an enormous amount of money with Kmart. I was making a pretty good living. Of course I had two children that are that are, you know, yeah. teenagers and I had to think about them and I didn't want to spend a lot of money tied up in this. And to begin with, a lot of it was trial and error and I thought well I won't have too much money tied up in this if you know if things don't work out yeah yeah in the yeah there's always that side of it isn't there you need to be it's yeah. all well and good chasing a dream but you need to be sensible that, that's right don't yeah. put all don't put everything into it and yep. then, but that worked out great yeah <laughs> <laughs> and what about all the other tools you know like your stops and I mean there's not a lot else you need but certainly like kilns and stuff how did you go about acquiring all of them back then well, that uh, I just had to bite the bullet and uh, and go out and buy the kills. I mean, they back in nineteen seventy nine, uh, you could get a kill for under a thousand dollars, ten mm. cubic foot. Now they run you about thirty five hundred. Yeah, for yeah. the same kill. Um, but but I used my kills for years and years. I just uh, put new elements in them and and put new wiring in them and keep using them. Just keep them. them going. Yeah, keep them going. Yeah. I've had these two out here probably 10 years. Mm. And <clears throat> up until about three or four years ago, they were getting burned pretty regularly every week. Really? Yeah, and now that I've slowed down the production pottery and increased the uh, feature work, it, I don't, it takes me longer to fill a kill now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a little bit easier on the kilns, eh? It, and it should be, yeah, it should yeah. be. But uh, that's, uh, it'd take you about a day to rewire a kill. Yeah. So you have to set a day aside for that. And, and that's I, a day you're not earning. Yeah. Yep. And when I mix clay, uh, I, would, I would usually start out at daylight and mix clay all day until 6 o'clock in the evening. And I would, I would all, my goal would be to mix a ton of clay in a day, which would last me about four months. Wow. Okay. And at the end of the day, if I had made the ton, which was my goal, I would have handled that clay eight times so that 2,000 pounds was 16,000 that I had handled that day. So yeah. you can imagine uh, how tired I would be. <laughs> yeah. Slept good that night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. slept good. Slept yeah. good. Yeah. What about um, is it Georgia clay you're using? Because George, I believe Georgia's got good clay, does it not? It it does, but not by itself. The majority of the clay that goes in my formula comes from Ohio. Oh, really? Oh. There you go. Oak Hill, Ohio. Ah. Yeah, it's gold art, uh, stoneware clay. Now, now I use seven different ingredients in the clay. And you make all your clay. It's not bag ball clay. You make it all from scratch. I, I made all of my clay until about uh, five years ago, and then I started buying a a blend a, a white clay that I mix with it. And um, that's the reason I have to do a lot of wedging over the wire because I mix them together. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. And. Uh, that way I don't have to mix clay nearly as often. Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the man that I talk to make pottery mixes the clay now and I buy it from him. Right. Uh, it's, you know, at, at my age, I don't like getting out there no. and working 12 hours a day on. 
and you're not saving any money very much, you can mix clay for about 12, 14 cents a pound. And it costs you about 45 cents a pound to buy the clay. So you're not saving enough money to offset mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Especially by the time you take a day out from actually making. Yeah. You're yeah. at a point now where you've got a making problem, not a selling problem. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. Now, if you weren't selling everything that you made, nothing lost. But yeah. when you're forfeiting a day of turning for a day of making, making. clay, you're kind of backing up. Yeah. <clears throat> but more than that, my age played a bigger part in it than what I'm telling mm. you because I reckon I'm just... Uh, I reckon I'm just determined enough that I was going to use my clay. This was yeah. going to be my clay. That's how I've always done it. Yeah. 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 Right. What about, um, you know, all the little hand tools and stuff like that? Even simple things like your wiring, your stops, like was that all easy to get when you started or did you have to make all that stuff yourself? Because I now made, it's so easy to get all that stuff. It is now. It is now. But I made all of mine. Uh, <clears throat> these pieces right here are... <clears throat> What's used in the cockpit, it used to be, I don't know if they use it now, but it used to be used in the instrument panel of an airplane. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Came from Lockheed. <laughs> That's cool. So what were they, just throwaways from Lockheed? Well, I don't know, I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> but you got them. <laughs> Scrub out Lockheed. Yeah. Just yeah. somebody from Lockheed said, hey, uh, well, Mr. Gordy's the one that told me. Uh, he said, if you find somebody that works at Lockheed, so I have to blame him with my crime. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> yep. He said, if you know somebody that works at Lockheed, they'll bring you some of that stuff and said it lasts forever. And it does. I mean, yeah. I've got these tools that I've been using for years and years, the same one over and over. Just keeps going. Just, yeah, they just, if you don't let them drag on the wheel a lot, uh, use these for the bigger pieces, and then I've got the smaller ones. And, and of course, a trimming tool, you know, could be just as simple as a, uh, as a band that would, might come around lumber, or this happened to be a stainless steel one, and I just bent it, a little tape, sharpen the edge of it. And that's oh, it's just I, a nail band for round. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what yeah, I yeah. trim with. Got a good hand hold. Yeah. Uh, and if you need to make a ridge, you just use that part there and make a ridge. And, you know, when you want to rib a bowl or something, you can just let it work in there. Do you think there's a lot of worth to young makers, maybe start out makers, making their own tools and doing all this rather than just buying what's available? I, I think that you, uh, you can spend a lot of money. Uh, j just for instance, something like this, uh, very simple to make. You can see where I taped it together. <laughs> uh, very simple to make. I mean, you can pay $5 for it or you can pay 30 cents for it. Yeah. Yeah. And when this one breaks, I just use these same pieces. I, I bought one and I've used these same pieces for years and years and just put a, bit of wire put on a it. new wire on it and use it. You can really start to reduce the entry level bar when you start yeah. thinking like that, can't you? Yeah. yeah and... Uh, and I use newspaper yep. to, to wrap my pottery in. <clears throat> so I go over <clears throat> to where they bring the newspaper back. Instead of getting newspaper from somebody that's read it and it's hard to deal with it, you go over there and it never has even been unfolded. You just... Oh, really? It's the, the overrun? It's overrun. The, the, the additional prints? That's prince. exactly yeah, right. Okay. And I've got, a, I've got a friend over there that I call her and she says, come on over, I've got some paper for you. And occasionally I give her a coffee cup or something and we're... we're How many hundreds do people probably spend on packaging wrap. peanuts oh, yes. and wrapping? Yeah. 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 And, and another thing too <clears throat> is if I buy paper bags wholesale, uh, I probably pay about 14 cents a piece for them. And if I go to Aldi and tell them I want a, a bundle of uh, bags, I get them for 12 cents a piece. No, no, eight cents a piece. Eight cents a piece. So they give me a bundle of 200 for $16. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Instead of going to a real packaging, like an online packaging place that will charge you 120 pounds for that. Yeah, you you go to Uline, or, or is it called U-L-I-N-E? -I, I call it Uline. But uh, if you go to them, you're probably going to pay 25 cents a bag. Yeah, yeah. 
easily. And who needs the bag but the handles? I mean, that's not the bit you need, is it? You just no. need the bag. Yeah. Just need the bag. Yeah. And the newspaper works fine. Um, and I reclaim all the clay that's in here. It's in those buckets behind you. Yeah. And uh, I just put it in there, soak it, put it on the plaster bats, and reclaim it. Um, there's uh, there's a way to save money, and you can do it on a budget. Yeah. Yeah. And that's by not taking tax. a credit card, that's another two and a half, three percent. Venmo doesn't charge me anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So doesn't charge you or me. Yep. It's and brilliant, it's, isn't it? And it's worked out real good for that's me good. to to do that. Things can add up, and um, you don't notice it sometimes. But later down the line, you're like, "Well, I was spending a lot of money on yeah. these things." And, yep. and you are. You mm. really are. And uh, in your habits will cost you some money if you're not careful uh but but um i learned a lot of the a lot of the things that i use i learned from mr gordy um how to do it mm. and and i have two people that are making pottery one is making pottery for a living that i taught and another one is retiring after Goodness, 30 years of school teaching. Wow. I taught him. I taught uh, pottery at Reinhardt College for five years. And he was one of my students. And and he hung on to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. So what about... On you, sorry. No, go ahead. What about... You obviously learned a lot from Mr. Gordy and you've taught a few people, but what about apprenticeships or further teaching? You know, because after you, does this all stop? Yeah. Or have you looked at bringing on apprenticeships in your final years? Have you looked at how do you continue this legacy that Mr. Gordy gave to you that then continues, that then continues? I don't think it's going to except uh, that Ronnie Payne in Emerson, Georgia, is the, is the one he and Jamie Laney are the two that, <clears throat> that I taught. But it's not going to continue in his family. And I'm not sure about Jamie. I don't know him that well anymore. Mm. But my family, there's nobody in my family that... Uh, I won't say there's nobody that's interested. My grandson was very good. He worked here for four years when he went to Shorter College. And then he went for his master's degree at New Orleans uh, Baptist Theological Seminary. Okay. And so he didn't get to work here because right. he lived down there. Just too far away, isn't it? And then when he finished, he immediately got called to a church in Baton Rouge. So they live in Baton Rouge now. Right. And I would be glad to pass all this to him and, and he could use it. But I'm not sure that he will. Uh, that is That remains to be seen. I, I don't know what what he may do. But would you be open to it? Oh, yeah. 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 It uh, seems a shame for it to go. It does. It, yeah. it seems. It, it, I read um, Mr. Gordy's book. I panned through it this morning, and it's very clear that that's a lineage. Yeah. And you're obviously part of that lineage, and it's one of the big things that that we are very keen on, and why we do what we do and spend ludicrous amounts of money flying around the world to capture these stories is because, like, when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. You can learn so much online, but you can't learn that that little bit of magic online. Yeah. You know, without sitting down with you for days, months, years, it's gone. And I'm very excited about this because this is something that my family will be able to hold on to. And I had my little great granddaughter out here this morning and she watched me make a piece of pottery for the first time. Oh. How old is she? Uh, she's 16 months old. Wow. Let's see. Oh, wow. March, April, May, June, July. She'll be, I guess she'll be 17 uh, on the 17th of this month. Brilliant. And then my grand, my great grandson is too much younger than, than she is, but he's out in Baton Rouge. But, uh, and I told May, I said, this is so neat because this is something that my family will have to look back and, and and at least see part of what I did, and I'm writing a book too. Uh, oh, if I can ever get it finished, I've yeah, got sure I've yeah. got it all together. Yeah, and I just need to tear myself away from here and and get Clear it finished. Book, yeah. Yeah. Now we go to the beach for a month every year since May retired, so I hope 
that, th that this September will be the four weeks that I'll put I'll cap it off. I've got everything. I just got to get the layout right. Nice. You should and then, definitely finish it. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, finish it. Yeah. And my grandson and uh, and his girlfriend are going to help me with that. He's the one. My grandson that did the video for me. Mm. He's going to help me with that. Well, if you need any help taking it to print or with design or layout, let us know. Okay. That's what we do. Oh, you know, okay. We publish our own book, we sell publish. Right. So if we can help at all, let us know. Because it'd be a real shame to see it to see it go. Yeah. Or to not finish just not to finish the, that the last bit of your book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you go. They've got all the information in my computer down there uh, if, if if they would choose to but I wanna get it uh I've got everything in the middle. I just need to get the front and the, the back. back of it. Yeah, you just need to sandwich it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm determined that this fall I'm going to finish it. That'd be great. Well, we'll follow up on that. For sure. sure you get yeah. <laughs> Next time we're in Georgia, we'll swing by for a copy. Yeah. Now, do you come to Georgia often? This is actually the second time we've been here this year already. Yeah. Really? So Tim made us a pen on the launch of Edition 6, which was March and they put so much work and so much time into that pen, it didn't feel right to let them post it out. Back to Scotland, so, so we decided that we'd come here and Yeah. So it may it. have worked out cheaper just to buy a pen off them, but, <laughs> but we flew out and we met great <laughs> friends, and yeah. And then this time we've got a friend in Alabama who makes Western saddles, whose wife's with the military and she was away and he had loads on and a student, and so we were like, well, we can work from wherever. So yeah, we'll come out. And then obviously because we were in Alabama, why, we, we couldn't not come by and see yeah. Tim and Tracy for a week, so. And then they'd met you just last month. Yeah. So they were like, well, we need to go and see them, so. Yeah, yeah it's they, wicked. I think they, uh, I can't remember why they came, uh, they saw something. Tracy came and Because they're, they're total yeah. maker. Yeah, geeks it might have been in the just, best way. They just love it. Yeah. That's why we love like that's why we love the people we meet. Like they just they just love it. They consume it. Yeah. So it's like it's just great. They've obviously seen it, swung by, and they made the introduction. So, uh, so hey, we've asked you loads of questions. I've managed to so work through a lot of that list, which was actually really helpful. I'm going to yeah. get everyone on a podcast now to write a list. Is that but the list? list? Yeah. <laughs> I I've made a note here. Uh Mr. Gordy and I had a real good relationship. Uh, I guess for a teenager, and a, he was in his 50s when I went to work there. I think he was 5'0", I think he right. was a big baby. But he, in his book, he said I was the best worker that he ever had, and he declared that they were upwards to 30. I don't know exactly how many. But I came in one day, and it was cold. And it was uh, the first cold snap of the fall. And I knew we hadn't mixed clay in a while. And when I walked in, well, Ronald, how was your day? And I said, oh, it was great. It was great. He said, well, guess what we're going to do today? And I said, I know. He said, all right, smart Alec, tell me. I said, we're going to mix clay. He just, <laughs> he just turned around and said, well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the way we mix clay is it, it was called washing the clay. Okay. And we went, we took the pickup truck and we would drive over to Atala, Alabama, and there was a man who had property over there that had a, a vein of clay that was just as pure as anything you've ever seen. I mean, I mean it was like gold clay, you know? Right. And, and we would take some two-by-twelves, a wheelbarrow, some shovels, and we'd go over there and we'd dig the debris back off of it, put the two-by-twelves across the ditch the, uh, the, uh, of where the road was because the clay pit was close to the road and then we put another tube of 12 up on the tailgate and we'd take that wheelbarrow and load it up with clay and roll across the ditch roll up on the pickup <laughs> and put clay on the pickup until it sat like this yeah and we'd do that at least once maybe twice a year then we'd take that clay and we'd mix it with some uh, mined clay the powdered clay mm -hmm. and we would put all that into a 55-gallon wooden whiskey barrel full of water. And we'd let it soak or slake, that's what we called it, for a couple of days. And then we had a big, a big hole like you mix mortar with that has the holes in it where it lets the mortar flow through. Yep. And he would, he would straighten one of those out and put a 
one inch water pipe on it so that you could get real good leverage and we would mix that clay with that with that uh hoe and and that clay would just roll and roll and you could tell when you'd get to where it was easy to do you could tell you were ready right and then we had a vat in the ground that was it was very simple it was four one by twelves just in a square and it had a, a metal water pipe one inch water pipe about that far from the edge of it and then we had a a 50 mesh screen that was uh built on a on a wooden frame the bottom of it was a screen one person would take a, a, a metal pail and pour that clay over into that uh wire strainer and the other person would shake it and when you'd get through shaking it and get through putting all that clay through it the only thing you'd have left would be the sticks and the rocks from the dug clay yeah, yeah. And that would go into that vat, and after a day, the water would rise to the top, and then there was a slit, uh, just a little slit in the side of the uh, vat that you would patch up with clay. You'd take your finger, and you'd knock that clay out of it to where that water would run off of it, and then that clay would sit there, and we had a big screen that we would sit on it to keep the leaves out of it, and then we had a roof that we put on it if it rained. Just two people had to put it on and that clay would stay in the ground for sometimes 10 or 12 days. And when it would start to crack open, then we'd go in there and dig it out and bring it in and work it like I do this. That's the way we mix the clay. Jeez, that's, that's a crazy. lot of work. Yeah. A lot of people work. can just buy it in a bag. I know. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, yeah. Isn't it? But, but that's how I learned to mix the clay. And I guess that's the reason I was so adamant about mixing my own clay all those years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gave you a bit of satisfaction to be able to say, well, this is my clay. Yeah. And this is my glaze. And, yeah. you know. I suppose there's also part of it that if a supplier changes recipe, that would be a very different yeah. thing for you. But if you've made it, you know it's to your What's recipe. Yeah. You know, and if I, you go and buy two tons of clay and it's all ever so slightly different and mm. then you start having a nightmare, that really costs you in production. And it has happened. Yeah. It has happened. I can imagine. I, I have bought clay. I bought clay before that didn't really take the glaze like it should, and I know. Well, that. really, you didn't find out until you were at the glaze point. That's I, a lot of work. And I know, and I know good and well they had mismixed it. But the way I remedied that is, I took a little bit of it and mixed it with a whole lot of mine. Right. And I watered it down so much that way that it didn't affect it. Right. Right, okay, so you could reclaim some of it, but that work was lost. That's, yeah. Uh, not necessarily lost, it's just that they came out, let's say, for instance, you're doing a set of dishes, yeah. and somebody wants all their dishes to be the same color. Uh, you know, they, they want them to relatively match. Yeah, of course. And this clay wouldn't, wouldn't mm, match okay. up. So that had to be a set. You could mix it with something <laughs> right. from, right. And yeah, you I could see. sell them to somebody else, yeah. but not the person that originally That's wanted them. That's yeah. how I got my dishes. I was mixing glaze one day, and I don't know what happened. The phone rang or something. So when I answered the phone and went back, I'm thinking, now what was the last ingredient I put in here? I think I put iron in it twice because I got my wife a set of dishes that's almost red, iron red. Yeah. And I had made 12 place set. And I took a plate down there, and I said, honey, how do you like this glaze? She said, oh, I like it. I said, would you like to have a set of dishes, 12 place set of dishes? And she said, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah you didn't do anything wrong. She snuck more in. <laughs> yeah, she wanted extra so, dishes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. She's still living that one up. She's like, I snuck that in. <laughs> That's um, fantastic. I met her in uh, ninth grade English. We became wow. real good friends. And ninth we, grade? That's great. What age does that work out to be? Like 1959, the year I went to work in the pottery shop. Oh, wow. So 14. Wow. I was 14. So we were friends. Uh, we sat in pep rally together every Friday, but we were just friends. And uh, so when the junior prom came, we were decorating the gym. The juniors, it sponsored the prom for the seniors. So mm -hmm. it's called Junior Senior Prom. And so she had been on a tour with the Glee Club performing to other schools. They went around and did their songs for other schools. And when she got off the bus to go back into the building, I was coming out of the gym where we had been working on the decoration. And we were talking on the way up, 
And and I told her goodbye, and she walked a couple of steps away. And I said, Maceel. And she turned around, and I said, would you like to go to the prom with me? And Aww. she said... That's so that was so our first sweet. date. There you that go. was our first date. Wow. Oh, that's that's so fantastic. It doesn't happen often these days yeah. that young, does it? We were yeah. 18, 19 when we met. I think we were some of the youngest we know for sure. Yeah, yeah I was 17, then when we married, we were 18. There you go. 18. Brilliant. They said it would never work. <laughs> <laughs> 60 years later. Yeah. Brilliant. Amazing. It, Is there anything else you want to cover? Well, I think we've covered it all. I was looking over here. I had a note or two in there, and I, I, I was looking here to see if there's anything that was uh, earth-shattering or jolting. And What about last projects? Have you got any other projects on your mind that you want to complete? Any ongoing or anything that's rattling around in your head that you'd love to do before you wind it all up? No, I, I think... Uh, I, I think that... Um, Mainly, mainly what I'm concentrating on now is just really getting better at 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 expression. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, it, when you got a piece of clay, there's not much difference in uh, happy and goofy, right? Yeah. But now I did get happy on him. Oh, yeah, he he's happy. Yeah, he's yeah. happy. You need to show the camera this one. <laughs> yeah, that's happy right there. Yeah. See, there you go. I even named him Happy. See? Did you? <laughs> so is that the first oh, one that you think brilliant. that's happy? And see, this was so successful, the castation that I started calling these buggy jokes, castation buggy buddies. Nice. And and people, it it kind of gives people something to collect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you do is. Many, but that is a pretty good expression. There. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good, even like this far on in your career, that you just want to keep getting better, getting and, better, better, and, better. and better. Yeah. 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 You're and not just like, okay, that's me. You're yeah. still challenging yourself, and you know, it's really good. Like it. I love it. Yeah. Oh. That. Uh, well, I'm excited about this. Uh, good. That that I was oh. able to. Tell you my story. Yeah. Mm, we love to hear it. And that I still have the right mind to do it. I yeah. think. Did I miss something? Oh, no, no, you were great. <laughs> We've got one final question. The Kate stays quiet for most of the podcast, yeah. but she always comes in with the qu Kate's quality over quantity. <laughs> so Kate comes in with a good yeah. question at the end. What advice would you give your younger self? What what now? What advice would you give your younger self? Oh, my younger self. What yeah. advice? Well. Uh, it's a hard question. <laughs> it's it's not it's it's not a hard question to answer. It's hard for me to it, it's hard for me to uh, give you the answer that I want to give. I was uh, very impatient as a young man, and I guess that the advice that I would give is to slow down not take anything that anybody says personal because when you do you start having problems and they don't know what they're talking about anyway yeah right that's the attitude you've got to take and um <clears throat> and of course i would have given this advice i think i've always done it treat people as you want to be treated and i've tried to always do that but the biggest thing with me is I was, uh, well, Mr. Gordy had it right, smart aleck. Okay, smart aleck, mm -hmm. you know. I shouldn't have said, I know what we're going to do. But that would be the advice, I, not, not to be cocky, uh, be humble and considerate and slow down and think about everything before you do it. I think that's really good I think advice. that's good advice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm very happy with how this went. Yeah. I'm really glad we got a chance to chat to you yeah. well, and I capture this little space and time. Yeah. I really hope you find someone to apprentice. Or write, well, finish your book. That's you need to thing. finish the book. Well, I promise to finish the book. Good. That's 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 number one on my list. And that's it's on, captured on, on camera here, now. so you got to finish yeah. it. Yeah, don't <laughs> care. You know, when I used to point 
I pointed like this, and now when I point like this, I'm pointing away because that finger won't straighten up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have to point like this. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I've, I've really, really enjoyed your time. Thanks so much for showing us around, welcoming us into your space. Yeah. Thank it's you. been fantastic. And for giving us a little. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. <laughs>